Okay, so uh, first of all, let me say how great it is, despite some inconveniences, uh, to be back in Israel again. It's been a couple of years since I was here last. But it is especially delightful for me to be reunited with Ruth Klinov, who, although I never took a class with her, the last time I saw her was 42 years ago. That was before she was born. <laughs> uh, and uh, we worked together at the Falk Institute in Jerusalem, which I don't know if it still exists. Does the Mahon Falk? And so it's a great pleasure for me to see you. And the theme of my talk is phased retirement, which couldn't be a more appropriate topic for both Ruth and me, uh, I'm 69 years of old, uh, of age. She's 63, <laughs> and you know neither of us have any plans to retire. So we are in, let's call it the in-between phase that I, I think a lot of people our age are going to be in as the years move on of transitioning between full-time work, which means we work like 24 hours a day, to partial retirement where we're only working 12 hours a day. And here is my mentor from MIT. Some of you may recognize Paul Samuelson. This, uh, I, I have the link to this website. This was one of the last lectures he gave. It was a keynote speech at a conference that I organized in 2008. So this is four years ago. He passed away at age 94 uh, in 2010, two years ago. So he was 92 when he gave this speech. And if you listen to it, uh, I think you'll all agree that he was in peak condition, mentally. It was very difficult for him to get around physically, but he had, assist, he had an assistant uh, who helped him. And the topic was what retirement means to me. And of course, his opening sentence was, I'm not sure what to say, you know, perhaps someday when I grow up and I'm ready to retire, I'll have some thoughts on this subject. But essentially the advice that he wound up giving uh, in, in the last few sentences of his speech was to young people, invest in your own human capital because it'll last a lifetime the best investment you could make. And he was responding to a question about how he allocates his retirement assets. You know, what proportion in stocks, what proportion in bonds. He said, I do have a retirement portfolio, but don't ask me what the composition of it is because I, I never look at it. All I can tell you is invest as much as you can in your own human capital. And that really is my theme today, and not just today, but all the research that I'm doing is about reframing the whole issue. It fits in very nicely with what Bernd had to say yesterday. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, uh, there was a talk by someone from Vienna who works at a uh, UN uh, research institute and it was all about reframing the issue of aging, not looking at how old people are in terms of measuring from the time they were born, but rather measuring from how long they're going to live. So starting from the end point and looking back to the present, and you get a very different picture, okay, uh, because taking account of life expectancy and improved health of the elderly, 
what has basically happened in, in recent times is society has become a lot wealthier because it now has this access to, let's call it, vintage human capital. Okay, that's the way I prefer to look at it. And in many fields, not in all, but in many fields, uh, the older the vintage, the more productive the capital. Okay, it's not, it's not really, doesn't work the same way as, say, physical equipment, factories, and machinery, but rather, uh, at least for some large fraction of the uh, of educated uh, elderly, you're tapping into a wealth of experience and knowledge of a particularly valuable kind because in general these are people who've seen many of the mistakes you can make. Okay, It's very easy. What happens is every 20 years or so we have another crisis because the people who were around at the previous crisis, this is particularly true with banking and the financial sector, people forget. They become overly optimistic and caution goes out the window. So you have another bubble, you have another crash, you have another crisis. It is particularly valuable to have people who've been through at least one crisis before and they know what can go wrong. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why, at least in some uh, tribes and cultures, they actually respect elders. And government is conducted by a council of elders. Uh, they don't call them retirees. They call them elders. And elders, I've been told in some languages, is actually synonymous with wisdom, which is something I think you gain from experience. So the real issue, as far as I'm concerned, is how do modern societies, Israel being one example, the United States being another example, how, do we ta how can we find ways of extracting from this huge wealth of human capital the maximum value to the benefit of society and of course to the benefit of the elderly themselves. That's the big question and uh, my discussant fortunately is going to be able to tell us among other things how she does it. Uh, I, I want to say a couple of other things before I get to the next slide and that is First of all, I view the value of meetings like this at, primarily as being uh, an opportunity to network and to expand the network. And it's particularly uh, important to do that in the area of retirement and issues of, of uh, work in the elder years. That's a better way to put it, maybe. Participating in the labor force uh, in one's later years uh, because the, the experiences of different countries are so varied. You really get to see a cross-section of approaches, much more so than, say, in banking, where even there, there are a lot of differences. But when it comes to retirement and social policies in general, health care, uh, there's a huge variety. So uh, the opportunity to meet my colleagues from Europe, uh, two of whom spoke yesterday, uh, and my Swedish colleague is, I think, speaking today about the, about the Swedish experience, whatever. Uh, hopefully, we can maintain this network, and one way to do that is through a common website. We can create a LinkedIn group. Maybe we'll think at dinner when we're celebrating, you know, my citizenship, we can try and come up with some and good drinks. and drinks after a lot of drinks we'll come up with a name for our linkedin network okay silver power or something 
I don't know. We'll come up with something. Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper I like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I learned two things yesterday about the Israeli system that I really was not fully aware of before. And I hope we can expand on it a little bit since we are in Israel. Uh, the first thing was making, uh, making private pension, occupational pension participation mandatory for the whole population. That's a huge, huge issue because it makes it a, uh, an all-inclusive coverage with all sorts of advantages that come from pooling of risks and uh, standardization and so forth. So I was very, very pleased to hear that. And uh, we in the United States are moving in that direction, but in a different way. It's, you know, in the United States, you don't want to make things mandatory because America, just American culture people instinctively say, if I have to do it, I'm not going to do it. So the way they do it in America is they say, okay, you don't have to do it. But the default option is you're part of the system unless you opt out. Okay, so that's the way. Now, in practice, the difference between making it a default option and making it mandatory is tiny. Because people, you know, inertia. If you put people in and they have to take action to opt out, they don't do it. They just stay in. Uh, so that's the way it's happening in the United States, by default. And that then becomes a discussion of, okay, so if someone is in and it's a defined contribution system like you have here, what if the participant chooses not to choose an asset allocation, a contribution rate, and so forth. And the answer, of course, is we have to have a default option for that, too. A default contribution rate, a default asset allocation. So that's where all the discussion is today in the United States. What should the defaults be? And translating that into Israeli terms or even European terms, it's what should the rules be, okay? Uh, now, I, my principal con concern is about the rules regarding phased retirement and, and uh, mandatory retirement. And uh, as many of you, I think, know, the United States is perhaps the only major company, uh, country that has law making it illegal to force people to retire. So I, as a, oh yeah, it's age discrimination. No, 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 there was a law passed, and it did not apply to tenured professors. The original anti-age discrimination law in the 1970s had a, an explicit exception for tenured professors. That was brought all the way to the Supreme Court and the court ruled in the 80s, it took a long time, that you could not have an exception for tenured professors. So even a professor, you know, who the university and maybe the students would like to get rid of, can't do it. That's age discrimination. As long as I can still spell my name correctly, they can't fire me. Hey, that's pe pepper and salt. Uh, and, and interestingly, I mean, uh, people who normally in their, there are a lot of professors now in that age range from 65 to 75 who are continuing to teach. And of course, like here, if the university can afford to let you keep your office, then even after you retire, you have office, you may share a secretary, okay? Uh, but in some cases, you know, where, where there's not space, you wind up in a broom closet or, you know, it's not exactly the best space available. But still, 
you have an affiliation, and that's very important. You, know, you can maintain your affiliation with the, with the university community. Uh, and it seems to me that's the way everybody is heading. I, I see, you know, that's kind of the way it is in Israel. If, if there's space, maybe they put you into a small broom closet here. Uh, and uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to mention. Oh, the other thing that I was surprised to hear about was this, and this was from uh, Haya, about uh, assisted living, which is now part of the official care for the elderly policy, uh, and how that is superior, more cost efficient really, or maybe not more cost efficient, but at least better than putting people in nursing homes. That's a big discussion, I think, everywhere in the world. Uh, it's, it'd be interesting to do a research project on the different aspects of that, both in terms of cost and welfare. From the point of view of keeping the elderly in their communities, close to their families, to my mind there's no question that that's a benefit in most cases. Although we had a paper yesterday that seemed to suggest otherwise, or it, maybe it was just a comment on the part of somebody, uh, that when they had the chance to move out of their child's house, they, was it you? That's it. That's it. So some people don't view it as such a great thing to move in with their family in their elder years. Uh, but being in a nursing home certainly doesn't seem attractive to me personally. Uh, and so even if it does cost more to keep me at home uh, in my later years and have someone either in, in this country apparently from the Philippines and in, on the East Coast in the United States, it's mostly from the Caribbean islands, Jamaica and Trinidad and places like that. And they find really very caring people to take care of the elderly at a reasonable cost. That's a big issue. Uh, and I know Paul Samuelson for like the last 10 years of his life had someone 24 hours. And I think they were three people on rotation, eight hour shifts. Uh, there were things he couldn't do as he became frailer and less mobile. But his mind was as good as ever. And people used to turn to him. You know, he, the one thing he never mastered, which surprised me, was email. So he actually needed someone to print out his email for him, and then he would handwrite his, his answers. And, but so it's, in some respects, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, as we say, and in American English. But uh, nonetheless, imagine if we had lost the, his contribution during those 10 years to the development of you know, young people in the profession, all the articles he wrote, uh, it would have been a huge loss. Oh, this, uh, this one, I'm sorry. Okay, so here's something I think you should all know about, uh, and it has to do with networking. There is an organization of actuaries in the United States called the Society of Actuaries. Uh, they are, I think, the, the largest group, professional group of, of actuaries in the world, and they have affiliations with actuarial societies in the UK, in Europe, and elsewhere. I assume there is an actuarial society in Israel, but I don't know. Actuary. Actuary. 
actuaries. Yes, it is. It is. And you know, you know how you know how they tell the difference between an actuary and an accountant. No. <laughs> okay. The actuary is the one who's looking at his own shoes when he talks to you, and the accountant is looking at your shoes. <laughs> So, you know, because of this exciting reputation that they have, they don't get invited to many conferences or, you know, to celebrations at restaurants and so forth. So they tend to hang out with each, <laughs> with, with each other, which, which is a pity because these are very, very smart people. people. Yeah, I mean, once you get into the realm of mortality tables, there's no one more exciting. They come to life. They have great jokes about mortality. I mean, you can imagine. It's great fun. <laughs> and they tend, they tend to tell jokes about funeral parlors and things like that. Uh, convention, yeah. Convention, and he, he opened uh, his speech by saying that uh, the difference between uh, the, the, an economist is uh, as good as an actuary about numbers, but he does not have the right personality. For <laughs> That's good. Uh, so at any rate, they have a project which, it's ne which is now in its uh, fifth year, and it is a global project called Living to 100. And this is the website. I have a link to it uh, in this slide. They have now issued, the, so first of all, you can read these very, very interesting papers about trends, medical trends and so forth that affect life expectancy. Uh, the best that I've seen, actually, very comprehensive. At these conferences that they have, once every three years, it's a, it's a triennial event. And the last one was in 2011. So they, they have posted all those PowerPoint presentations and so forth. Some of them are absolutely fascinating about research, genetic research that's being done to extend uh, life expectancy and uh, Lots, not just uh, actuarial science and economics or sociology, but really the hard sciences as, as well, uh, life sciences as well. So I recommend that to you. But they are also putting out a call for papers for the next conference, which is 2014. And these are international conferences. The next one is at Disney World in Orlando, Florida. So, you know, if you want to take your children or grandchildren, write a paper. <laughs> or, uh, or an actuary. That would increase your chance. Marry an actuary and you're in for sure. Okay. Uh, this is the call for papers. And I think the dev so the conference is in January 2014, and uh, I think the deadline is September for submissions of, of papers, uh, topics at least. Okay, so here's a table that, and this is my last slide. Uh, this table was put together by a good friend of mine who is an actuary and uh, has a great sense of humor. Anna Rappaport, uh, who is uh, very well known in the actuarial profession. She, she spent her career at Mercer, which, one, which is one of the big international human resource consulting firms, benefits consulting firms. They probably have offices in Israel as well. Uh, and she and a, and a uh, colleague put together this table that looks at different factors of labor force, that relate to the elderly in labor force 
participation. That's the first column. So one is, uh, what are the usual retirement ages? And they try and predict, they say what it is today, 2030 forecast and a 2050 forecast. So this is their best guess, but it's an educated guess, okay? Because they, Anna Rappaport is the one who writes the summary report for each of these Living to 100 conferences. So she's really plugged in to what the actuarial community and, and related fields are thinking. Uh, and not just in the United States, but around the world. So the second is the method of existing, uh, of exiting, that should be exiting the labor force, not existing. Uh, so uh, let's just talk about the retirement age, because that's kind of interesting. So today it's between 62 and 65. By 2030, their prediction is it'll be 67 if you take early retirement and 70, so it'll extend by five years. And uh, then another, you know, four-year or five-year extension by 2050. So they're saying it'll all move by 10 years, okay, the normal retirement age uh, over the next 40 years. That's their projection. Uh, and that's in line with what we were talking about in terms of trends in increasing life expectancy. Um, method of exiting the labor force, and this is where we get into phased retirement. So currently, it's typically you just sudden stop, okay? You go from switched on to switched off, and you quit your job. Uh, and it is fairly common to continue working in a different career uh, for some period of time during those first five to ten years of retirement. So you might find a, uh, a sociology professor, for example, flipping burgers at Burger King for five or ten years on a part-time basis. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, that's not what happens. But becoming a consultant uh, on a part-time basis, doing research work and so forth. Uh, and that is going to become more common. That's their prediction. Phased retirement options are going to become very common and very routine. Uh, it will be very common to start a new career after age 50. So rather than two careers being an exception, it will become more of a norm. You do one thing, you know, from age 25 to 50, and then something else from 50 to 75. Uh, of course, we have people who do that now. You know, they might, Henry Kissinger was a professor for the, up until age 50, and then he became a diplomat, okay? Uh, for the second half of his career. And he's, he's probably in the third stage of his career right now with his consulting firm, Kissinger Associates. Uh, so the prevalence of formal phase retirement programs, today very rare, they predict that by 2030, there'll be maybe 20% of large employers will have formal programs of phased retirement. Uh, and, uh, and then that percentage increased to 40% by the year 2050. The next thing is the role of the family in helping older persons. And of course, that depends tremendously on the family, the nature of the family relationships and so forth. Uh, the last thing, though, structure of disability programs is extremely, extremely important. And, and this is where I think the Israeli experience becomes something that we in America can learn from. Uh, assuming it's working well, or even if it's not working well, that too uh, is, is valuable knowledge. So right now, uh, it's very rare to find formal programs 
there is long-term care insurance in the United States, very limited market. And the insurance coverage is not terribly good, uh, particularly if you want there to be a cost of living clause in it. And, but it exists, and uh, I would say assisted living in the home is extremely expensive and really works only for people who are really, uh, I wouldn't say very wealthy, but certainly who have saved millions of dollars. Uh, I know my, my father-in-law spent the last five years of his life uh, having round-the-clock care, and they were Jamaican women, and it pretty much exhausted his, the amount that he had saved. Uh, and that was several million dollars. So this is not cheap. Uh, and that's why I, I find it so interesting that in Israel, that's sort of the, becoming the norm, and it's part of the national system. Yeah, the national uh, drug system. Exactly. That's, that's really... If someone wants to write a paper on that, submit it to the Living to 100, that would be a valuable paper. Uh, and, you know, their projection is that that is going to change, that it has to change uh, in the U.S. because the population over the age of 65 is going to be huge. It's also going to be a very powerful political lobby. So my guess is we're going to see some kind of national disability program in the United States especially since the few companies that have offered comprehensive long-term care insurance are getting out of the business. So we at Boston University used to, I'm on the benefits committee, so I know, you know, what's available and what we can offer. And we used to offer long-term care insurance voluntary uh, to university personnel through the John Hancock and last year they discontinued their program. We've been looking around for another provider and there are very few. Now, there's only one now, Genworth, which to me means the government's going to have to step in in one way or another uh, for these assisted living type arrangements. Okay. Uh, that's all I have to say as an opener. <laughs> Root.